Hi. A very good afternoon to everyone that are with us uh, in this episode 31 of the Tough in Tech series. Uh, earlier this month, we had an amazing panel discussion that shared their thoughts on digital talents, covering trends, issues, and all. If you missed it, you can watch the recording in the Top in Tech FB page. Uh, it's still there. Following on from that conversation, we would like to say thank you to the Human Resource Development Corporation, HRD Corp, for supporting the Top in Tech series today, bringing us today's conversation on HR 5.0, Elevating Human Resource Capital Investments. Businesses today from micro to global company are inundated with great challenges in their talent pool, be it digital talents or otherwise, from recruitment to retention. So with today's great lineup of human resource experts that we have here on the show, I hope we can all walk away with some nuggets of wisdom on how we can get to HR 5.0. Over to you, Karam. Thank you, Zilia. Yeah, you're right. I, I actually, when I saw HR 5.0, I, I, I broke out in cold sweat. I said, hey, man. Everybody's on 3.0 or maybe 4.0, right? And we're already on 5.0, maybe inspired by 5G. So I, I had to clearly read up, but actually it, it's something new and it's something that also I think HRD Corp is, is championing. So it's going to be interesting to hear their take on it. But as usual, what we do, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for our uh, latest episode of Top in Tech. We've got three interesting panelists. One is an entrepreneur running one of the leading startups in the country. Then we've got the chief executive, a C-level suite of one of the leading you know, MNCs in the country. Then we've got somebody from the government public sector, right, pushing and driving a, a talent development, uh, a awareness of talent trends or so. So it's going to be a, a quite a nice mix. We, tr we try never to have the same three kinds of people, right, to speak where all are from the same background or same vertical. So with that, we're going to get started and I'm going to actually invite Derek uh, to come on to, uh, for his opening three minute remarks on what he thinks about this topic. Derek? Oh, hi. Hi, Karam. Uh, hi. Hello. Hi, hi everyone. So I, I'm Derek. Uh, I'm the founder of Hiredly. Uh, if, you, if, you if you don't know us, um, we, we, uh, we're a recruitment platform. We specialize in like Gen Y, Gen Z uh, talent. Um, so yeah, so just a very, very quick intro. Uh, originally, I, I, I sort of started highly uh, because I wanted to help a lot of talent find the right culture, the company with the right culture to work in. So I, I didn't actually approach it as a business person or, or an entrepreneur. I actually approached it as an artist. Like, I love the concept. I think a lot of Malaysians would love it. And, and, and when we launched, we, we got lucky and it, it, in the sense where it grew very organically. A lot of employees said, hey, I love this idea of using culture to attract talent. A lot of talent also love that idea. And over time, we, we sort of, what we realized was that um, uh, uh, man, uh, it, when it comes down to it, right, actually a lot of talent want to choose the company that they work in. It's not mm. just about choosing jobs, you know, and that's why the, the concept of culture was so attractive. Mm. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and we've evolved to what we are today, like using kind of like an online on offline approach because we think this uh, decision to find the right job, the right career is a very complex one. So mm. if, you, if you're going to just rely on a text-based job description, it really, really <laughs> doesn't serve that purpose very well. Mm. And uh, that is sort of like the, the concept of what higher league is. Like. So yeah, and I'll share more about what I think about HR 5.0, maybe perhaps after this. I think, I, I think your perspective will be interesting because you're coming really from, of course, uh, Gen Z also, right? And the tail, tail end of Gen Y, correct? So it's going to be interesting to see uh, your thoughts on this, but uh, what, what we'll do is thank you for your thoughts. Now we're going to uh, invite Chai Ping onto the screen, direct, uh, and then uh, you can uh, chill for a few few minutes, right? And then uh, Chai Ping, uh, get your thoughts on, on this topic also. Opening thoughts. Thank you, um, Karam. Um, you know, just like you, you know, I woke up with a bit of a cold sweat as well, thinking, oh, you know, 5.0, because uh, I, I think some of my friends uh, and, and you know, some peers in the network kind of saw, you know, Malaysia Kinis and, and they said, oh, is it? 5.0 already I said yeah you know I, I had to you know it's uh, either a leap of faith or we you know we have just quantum leap right so mm. thank you very much for having me and good afternoon everybody um so I am the GM and uh, also the HR director of uh, Experian and uh, we've been in Malaysia for 14 years Experian is uh, the world's uh, leading um, 
a global information services company. And, uh, you know, we always pride ourselves on, you know, during life's uh, big moments, right, from buying a home or a car or sending a child to college or university uh, or starting, you know, a, a startup, right, like, like direct, right? Um, we empower consumers, right, and our clients who manage their data with confidence. We help individuals to take financial control and access financial services. So we are also in the business of, you know, uh, making sure that the underserved and under banks, right? Uh, right. And, and, and ensure that, right, um, they have financial inclusion as well. So uh, globally, we have over 20,000 uh, employees operating in over 40 countries. And uh, we are also listed uh, on the L London Stock Exchange. In Malaysia, we are one of the five global hubs, um, you know, and uh, digital talent and tech talent and all that, you know, obviously, um, it is something that uh, we, 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 you know, cherish. But okay. also, I think with great resignation and all that, right? I think uh, we all suffer from, uh, um, you know, the, the, the talent crunch, right? Yeah. And, uh, and how that we support that, especially if Malaysia is going into that digital economy. Yeah. So back to you, Karam. Okay. Interesting. When you, when you mentioned the, the talent crunch and before I bring on uh, uh, Dato Arif, who's actually uh, uh, replacing his CEO, Dato Shahul, Shahul who had a family emergency come up and couldn't join us. But when you talk about the talent crunch, I think Gartner in, in Florida, they had a, a conference and they were actually sharing that I think a few years from now, uh, companies, it's not about companies are replacing the talent, you know. It's about how companies can, can keep their talent and get the best out of them because there's such a talent shortage out there. If you lose someone, it's so much more harder to replace them. And, and companies, uh, there's going to be increasing focus on keeping your talent. And I think like what uh, Derek was saying, culture is important and, you know, uh, deeper. not just upskilling, but reskilling also. So a whole bunch of things. And I think there's going to be way more challenge for leaders and especially heads of talent, right, people development, to make sure that even if someone is not doing so well, how do you help him or her to be better at what they are? Instead of saying, okay, you don't meet our criteria, I think we'll manage you out and we'll look for someone else. That's going to be a nightmare. So interesting transition, Gartner predicting is going to happen. Uh, but you want to say something quickly before I bring on? Uh, uh, yeah, spot on, yeah, spot on, and then we'll have a further dialogue on that. Yeah, yeah, Thank okay, you. great. Okay, cool. So, okay, let's bring on Dato Arifna for his opening remarks on, on, on this topic also, on this subject. Uh, good evening, Mr. Karamjit. Uh, thank you so much for having us uh, having, or having HRD Corp. Uh, oh, you know, top in tech. Uh, I'm, as, uh, as you said earlier, I'm stepping in for my chief executive, uh, Dr. Shaul. He's had a family emergency. Uh, so as always, uh, you know, we are on standby. You know, uh, all of us are required to do what we can uh, when, we can, when we are called upon. Um, let me give you a, first a little bit of background of uh, HRD Corp. Yep. We were formerly known as HRDF, and this is because we started off in 1993 as what was known then as the Human Resource Development Council. Oh. Uh, um, since then, uh, you know, we've, we've carried on doing what we, we do best. Uh, we, uh, we are able to, um, to carry on and do what we do because we have an act of parliament. Okay. The power to collect levy from employers. Uh, and this levy is then used for upskilling, reskilling purposes of their employees. Um, um, the, the act itself is called the PSMB Act of 2001. Um, as of March uh, 2001, March of 2001 last year, uh, sorry, uh, 2021, uh, we were only covering uh, three sectors, mining, quarrying, services, and manufacturing. Okay. But the of the act, which took place uh, in March of 2021, uh, we now cover all sectors in Malaysia. So from three sectors, we now cover more than nine sectors. Wow. We used to cover just about uh, 23,000 employers, uh, maybe with 1.5 million employees. Today, we have 78,000 employers registered with us, covering some 4.5 million employees. Nice. Uh, this statistic is set to grow because we are expected to cover some 150,000 employers by the end of 2023. Wow. 6 million Malaysians. Um, so uh, with this added responsibility, of course, an expansion of our responsibilities, uh, we now, now not just cover employees, but we are expected also to look at sectors which do not have payers a levy, which do not have enough funds to do upskilling and reskilling. Uh, this is where government steps in. They provide us with government grants so that we are able to do for them what employers do for their employees. So this is an all of government, all of society approach to ensuring that Malaysians 
are able to take the next step in the evolution of the workforce. Nice, all of society, good. I, I think Chai Peng was saying just now, so they want to, they work towards making sure that the unbanked or underbanked also are, it's inclusive, right? They also have a role to play in the financial ecosystem. So good. Oh, so by the way, you got, so you're covering agriculture now also, Dr. Arif? Yes, we are. Because uh, agriculture also now, the buzzword is smart agriculture, right? You cannot just talk agriculture because you're going to attract the younger people to join agriculture. So it has to be smart agriculture. Okay, cool. Well, well hopefully you, you got a chance to bring that into the conversation also. But right now, let's bring back uh, Chai Peng and Derek also. And, and for those who've been attending Top in Tech episodes before, I always only have one question that I have that I ask all three panelists. And, and this is smack middle on the topic right, that brought us here together. So I'm going to ask all three of you, starting with you, Derek, and we'll go through the, the, the rotation again, which is right, for HR5.0, from your perspective or high least perspective, what does it mean? Uh, and uh, this, you know, this elevating uh, your, uh, your capital investments or the human capital investments? Yeah, so I, I actually think that um, HR will become an increasingly important uh, function in any business. Uh, and, and, and literally, I, I was just having lunch with a group of entrepreneurs just now. And all of them have huge issues with um, uh, challenges with talent. Mm. You know, it, you know, regardless of whether you're looking for a software developer up to like a frontliner retail person, everyone is having a challenge with talent. And I think this this largely has to do with the fact that I think the world is smaller, you know, and talent a bit more mobile, and there are many more options in terms of jobs. Yeah. You know? So it's a lot of competition for talent. The competition for that is amazing. And, and at the same time, there's a lot of talent that um, want more, like they expect more from their jobs, they expect more for their company. So for me, HR 5.0 is really, really adopting that mindset where companies are really looking at talent like an asset, hmm. focusing on things like culture, uh, you know, to try to give them, um, I mean, it cannot always just be competing using money, like. Yeah. Uh, for example, you know, so to, to, to give them a sort of a competitive edge, you know, and to really kind of elevate the way they look at human capital and also be thinking about using technology to give them advantages, right? When it comes to creating this kind of very, uh, uh, when it comes to human capital, right? Integrating the tools like the human element and also uh, technology. Okay. So I, I think, yeah, so the HR 5.0 for us basically means that. Okay, go cool, fine. You know, I'm glad you think that culture is smack in the middle is okay. So I uh, think you want to give your thoughts on, on what do you think, you know, this HR 5.0 and elevating uh, your human capital. Thank you. I, I think, um, you know, I, I really hope that HR 5.0 really lives, right, that holy trinity of the CEO, the CFO and the CHRO. And I think... Uh, if you look at the pandemic, right, I think it's really accelerated. And if we talk about the HR transformation journey over the last 10, 15 years, right, um, you know, I think HR has been on a journey, right? I think the pandemic obviously accelerated that and accelerated on many fronts. I think um, Derek spoke about it. Uh, and one of it is really, you know, people now rethink what work, workplace and workforce would look like, right? I mean, if you think about an in individual like myself, I work from home almost all the time now. Wow. You know, I would think three times, you know, whether I need to go into the office because, you know, the elder care, the child care and and and, and the hubby care, I, I, I must make sure I, I you know, look, do the hubby care as well, right? Um, it's all in balance, right? And, and the question of death and the idea of death and the notion of death has become more real for many of us post-pandemic, mm. right? And, and therefore, I think individuals and employees now want that freedom of choice, that freedom to choose whether, you know, this is the kind of work I want, this is the work environment I want, and whether the organization and to what Derek is saying about culture and probably employee value proposition, right? Does it, you know, stick with or resonate with my own ethos and my own value system, right? And you think about, you know, I was I was just kind of doing a little bit some light reading, right? And and you know the the you know the the likes of HBR and I think Karamjit, you mentioned Gartner and whatnot, right? Or even um, you know World Economic Forum and all that, right? If you think about the future of work, this has become more real. I think for years now, right? Uh, in Malaysia, as we transition from you know. Um, the industrial economy and then moving into the digital economy for years now. We've been talking about 
hey, you know, we need to work from home. Hey, we need to work from home. Hey, you know, bosses, you need to let your people work from home. But what happened during the pandemic on March 18, 2020, we all transitioned. Mm. Whether you're a small company, whether you're True. a new set, whether you're a multinational, whether you're a GLC, we all had no choice. We all had to work from home. And that had already accelerated, right? The digitalization. Mm. And I hope that, you know, um, if we look at HR 5.0 very quickly, in my mind, you know, we'll be probably going into, you know, 6.0, right? Oh. And if you think about the requirements for us today, people talk about digital HR. I'm not the most tech savvy person. Uh, I work in a data and tech company, but I'm not the most tech savvy person. But I have to try to keep up, you know, especially now with the Zen, you know, all the different yeah. uh, Zen this and Zen and now strawberry Zen. And I, I don't know what else is coming, right? Um, you know, you just have to keep up. You have to stay relevant, right? I'll, I'll probably uh, articulate a little bit more uh, as we open up the dialogue right but every aspect of the employee life cycle pre-onboarding post-exit right all that people used to think only as I hire you I need to look after you yeah. but actually pre-onboarding and after you, if you become an alumni how do we look after you uh, and all aspects wow. right careers learning right talent acquisition today are now cognitive recruiters right leadership uh, performance management and so on and so forth. I, I'm sure we have further dialogue uh, and, yeah. and let me pass the floor to Dr. Okay. Arif. No, it's so Thank interesting. Uh, uh, b before you jump in, Dr. Arif, right? Uh, interesting that I think I had lunch with an entrepreneur and he says that when they have their, their, their quarterly you know, staff get-togethers, even ex-staff are invited and welcome to join and hang out with them. And I was shocked, man. And now you are saying the same thing about taking care of your extra. That's amazing how this thing is changing, man. So, I anyway, I won't say more. Uh, Dato Arif, uh, your perspective of, of this, you know, talk, this question about HR 5.0 and, you know, your mm -hmm. capital investments, uh, talent. Yeah. Um, look, for us uh, at HRD Corp, we consider this uh, HR 5.0 as the next evolution of human capital development. Okay. While we are still in the era of Industry 4.0, we already hear talk of uh, having to embark on Industry 5.0. Uh, and for us, uh, this has become a concern because if our focus is on humanizing technology, we want to ensure that our people are not left behind. Okay. And make sure that they are not displaced by technology. So we want to stay ahead of the curve of this technological curve. And that's why we are promoting and pushing for HR 5.0 because we want employers to understand that at the heart of the business, at the heart of our nation's development, is, is our people, our assets. Our yep. And so we are trying to get employers to ensure that rather than replacing employees with machines, we want them to prepare our employees or prepare their employees so that they can take advantage of the technology that's available to drive their companies forward. And this is what we at HRD Corp, we, we are trying our very best. We are working with a lot of uh, top institutions around the world. Okay. Uh, companies like SAP, Oracle, Essential. You know, we are trying to make available what is out there uh, in the globe to our local employers. You know, because they have they have a levy with us, and we want to make sure that they can assess their levy and use it in a variety of ways to ensure that their employees are ready for the next uh, evolution of human capital development. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So I want to be ready for the next evolution, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm waiting to hear one particular word which I haven't heard yet. So but, uh, let's see if it comes out. If not, means I'll ask a question around there. But uh, let's move on to questions which have been asked by, by the audience out there. And for those of you who are watching live, please do uh, you know, submit your questions and we will endeavor to answer them. It's very important to us. I'll jump in with Derek first now again, right? So Derek, uh, and this is a question that I think a, a Fatin Hashim asked, right? Uh, uh, when he registered early, how would one tackle... This, uh, this meaning to stay traditional or to modernize your HR strategy solutions? To stay traditional or modernize HR strategy? Well, <laughs> I guess the, the short answer is that the world, the world changes whether we want to change or not. Hmm. So uh, at some point, um, uh, of course, modernizing is the right, uh, right long-term strategy, like, let's put it this way. And, and the, 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 the thing about modernizing sometimes is if you think very short term, the effort to modernize your practices and processes, etc., may not be very obvious in the beginning. You know, I, and, it's, it's, and and that's and and typically you might only see the effect a bit longer term. But if, if you start modernizing today, and mm -hmm. let's say you start having a competitive edge, like in terms of attracting and retaining talent, right? 
over time, like you will start to see changes in like the, the workforce that you have in the company. Mm. And if you, if you sort of like, and if you're in the group where, oh, let's keep it more traditional and stuff. By the time you decide to want to modernize, right, you already kind of left behind really. Because it takes so long to kind of like make that impact that other businesses already have an age. I mean, it's very cliche, right? We always say that, oh, like the ultimate is people yeah. that drive business, but it's, it's actually true. Whatever strategy you have or execution, right? It, it actually starts with like the, the strategy comes from your people. So if you, if you have a lot, if you have amazing talent in your company, uh, uh, you have a competitive edge. Yes. So yeah, basically modernize is the answer, but you would, you would expect to see the impact of it maybe coming, happening like one, two years, three years from now, you know, uh, and it's not that obvious. Uh. Oh, okay. Interesting. And you got to, yeah. And also I know that I think if you want to hire young talent, if your systems are processes are not, not uh, digital, right. They're going to be put off and they don't even want to consider working for an old company. So it is quite risky. Actually, if you don't, you don't modernize. Okay. Let's move on to, to, to uh, Chai Ping now, which, and this is a question that uh, comes from Kevin Tan, right. From cook, uh, cook pad. So what, what is the novelty that current HR is looking for? Interesting, they use the word novelty. So uh, uh, Chai Ping, uh, what is your take on this? Can I also just, um, you know, uh, kind of um, add on, right, to what Derek said, right? Because sure. I think, you know, uh, you know at, at, the, at the cost of modernizing and at the cost of digitalizing, uh, digitalizing, um, it, it should not be you know, at the expense of the digital experience and the employee experience because I think it all goes hand in hand, right? If we just digitalize and transform and think that, you know, once you enable, you know, uh, everything via technology without yeah. taking into consideration the employee experience and the digital experience, then, you know, um, the outcome of it may not be as favorable as, you know, as what we imagine, right? So I think, I think we just need to be, you know, cognizant of that. Um, and Kevin, thank you for your question. Um, to, with regards to you know, novelty, right? Um, you know, in, in the past, I used to think that uh, HR was perhaps a doormat, right? But uh, I, I think um, looking at it and, and fast forwarding to today, right? Um, as we are still, you know, enduring the pandemic, right? I think HR absolutely is, is pushed and thrust into the forefront, right? Of many, many aspects, right? Of an employee's uh, life, right? And, and therefore, if we have a seat at the table, what are you going to do about it, right? Um, I, I talked about relevance earlier on. I talked about uh, perhaps capability building as mm. well, right? As a HR professional, because you cannot not have you know, one or the other, right? Okay. Uh, and in a lot of times, you know, we, we think that, oh, HR, you know, it's not about, if I talk about the the uh, the holy trinity now, I mean, I think our CEOs, our global stakeholders, you know, our employees look to us, right? To make the key decisions for them, right? And yep. if I look at, you know, um, you know, looking ahead, right? And and I think this was a, a Harvard uh, a article, right? What are some of the future, the, the top 21 jobs HR jobs in the future. I, many of it, I don't even recognize. I'm mm. just going to wrap wow. it off. Genetic diversity officer, oh. right? Human network analyst, workplace environment architect, algorithm bias, algorithm bias, auditor. So that is already paradoxical, right? Wow. The work from home facilitator, chatbot and human facilitator, and so on and so forth, right? And when, when the idea of chief diversity officer came, we were like, what's chief diversity officer? Today, you can't talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, plus belonging, you know, in, in the new workplace, right? So therefore, I think the novelty will kind of um, go, you know, kind of, sizzle off, right? Mm. Uh, but, you know, us as a, as a HR professional, we really need to step up our game because it is a duty of care and because people look to us to make key decisions already. So hopefully, you know, Kevin, I've answered your question. If not, you know, happy to, to you know, uh, take follow-up questions from you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I think when you mentioned some of those jobs, I, I think in 2020, uh, LinkedIn does an annual list of like, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the top 10 jobs of the future. And one of them which struck me was that at some point, companies are going to be looking for a, 
a human robot, you know, a, a liaison or officer, right? Someone who will help other executives in the company, right? Learn to work together with robots. And I, I just, that just blew me away, man. I said, my goodness, what's coming down the line is crazy. But because of what's coming down the line, and I think Dr. Arif also kind of hinted at that. So a question for you now, Dr. Arif, right? So you mentioned three priorities of HR 5.0. So I want to put you in the spot and ask how is HRD Corp itself, right, implemented, embodied these values within your organization? So maybe provide an example of like, you know, maybe a tech adoption of, of upskilling or reskilling or maybe even downskilling. I've never heard the term before. Please tell me there is such a phrase as downskilling. And, you know, an example of maybe uh, employee health and well-being also. Okay. Um, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, the whole purpose of having technology is to make our lives better if not easier. Yep. Similar for us, you know, I, I feel that HR, for example, our HR here in HRD Corp, I think their job is primarily to ensure that our employees are able to do their best with what they have. And even if, even if the CEO or the CFOs, they don't see the need uh, for employees to transition from the way they do their work now to the way they need to do their work in future, because their priority is always the bottom line. But I think it's the role of HR to ensure that employees are given the opportunity to equip themselves with the necessary skills so that they can utilize the, stool, the tools available to make their work easier. So mm. that they have more time for themselves, more time for learning, and more time for adapting. Now, in here at HRD Corp, uh, we have uh, we've implemented Office 365. We have a go-to-cloud strategy, which is a hybrid multi-cloud ecosystem that improves the organization's speed, efficiency, and agility. We also have in place multi-channel uh, communication methods for our employees. Uh, other than the traditional WhatsApp, we also have uh, what we call Kaizala. Uh, we also have uh, uh, different teams set up so that the heads of those teams are able to interact directly uh, with their, their direct reporting lines. Uh, but this is not just internally, even with our, all our stakeholders, we've got multiple channels, we've got chatbots, we've got Ask Bella, we've got, uh, 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 we've got now a super app coming up that allows uh, our stakeholders to interact with us, but our employees are also able to uh, utilize the super app so that they too can make themselves available to all the uh, training programs available to our stakeholders. Uh, and I must uh, put on record and must mentioned that we have a learning platform called eLatte. eLatte, uh, okay. We make it mandatory for all our employees to at least uh, uh, ensure that they do 21 hours of training uh, for the whole year through okay. eLatte. It's a remote learning platform uh, because if this is what we ask of our employers and our uh, staff, correct. We make sure that our staff too uh, are given the opportunity to do the same. Understood. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, if you can just answer, what about something on, uh, I think I asked you also on uh, employee health and well-being. Is there anything you want to talk about that, that you all are doing? Yeah, our HR has been, has been great. You know, we have, we made sure that we have a webinar on uh, mental health, on uh, physical health. Uh, at least once a week, we invite uh, trainers uh, from our ecosystem to come in, talk to our, uh, to our uh, employees. We also have, at least once a month, we have events where we get together, we do a physical exercise, we go out of the office. Uh, we also have uh, health talks. Uh, we have uh, motivational talks, you know? So, so this is an ongoing process. We make sure that at least once a week. So in a year, you can imagine we have some 50 over yeah. for our employees. So, so that's something that's ongoing. Okay, all right, interesting. So lots going on there. Uh, let me now move back to Derek, right? So this is a question from a student. I'm, 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 I was quite quite happy. And I think we get, somehow the show, we also get quite a fair amount of, of like master's level and even postdoctoral students who, who want to join and participate in the discussion. But this is from Muhammad Faiz, right? And he's asking Derek, actually, what are the challenges in implementing HR tech nowadays? Uh, kind of interesting. It sounds like uh, HR tech maybe uh, three years ago was different versus nowadays. Uh, if you see any difference or just... Straightforward without the nowadays, maybe just answer the challenges in implementing HR tech. Convincing your CEO to do it. <laughs> oh, no, really? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and, what, and what I mean by that is that a, a lot of times CEOs or like the, the business driven people, they sometimes see HR as a sort of a back office or support oh, or okay. operational function, you know, and, and it's, it's a very important to be able to have a very uh, business-oriented conversation with them that they can see why it is important 
for the company to do this. So I always find that the best way to talk to like the business side of people is just a few things. Uh, number one, how does implementing this help us make money? Okay. Or how does implementing this help us save money? Or how does implementing this help give us a competitive edge? Like those, those like trying trying to speak to them uh, uh, from that angle can be very useful. Like, you know, let's say we, have, you know, if we implement this uh, technology in HR, it helps us attract great talent, retain talent, you know, and then therefore we can have a really good business. Or, um, or alternatively, if your business is very values driven, which is great, then you can use your values to kind of drive this conversation, you know. Uh, but again, this is... Um, this go uh, depends business to business. Uh. So if you ask me in terms of implementation, it is mostly the will to implement uh, or the will to change. Uh. That's the most important starting point because a lot of times if something seems to be working, the the CEO might be like, why why touch this now? You know, like so it's actually much more common than you think, right? Mm. And you always like, oh, like what's the impact if we implement this? How much is it going to cost? Like uh. those those like those questions will come up. So being able to speak to the business side about the impact to the business, I think is a, is a very important skill. Okay. But I think earlier also you mentioned when you're answering the first question, right, about if your, your systems are not digital, then you're not going to be able to attract the right talent. Or so. so surely that is the business impact uh, discussion, a, a point, right, a bullet that you have. That should uh, that should be able to convince CEOs, right? Or uh, do you think because maybe somebody wants to do a follow up? So what are the key points I can bring up to the CEO to convince him or her that we should invest in HR tech? So what if, if there was a follow up question on this? What are the two things you advise people? You bring up this point and bring up this point. Uh, to convince the CEO, is it? I, yeah, to convince the yeah. CEO that this is something important to invest in HR tech, so that you can move from paper based, right? Paper based, you know, or whatever, or, or just. Excel, sometimes maybe just using a Word document, that's, that's not digital, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, well, well if, you're, if you're lucky, if, if just by you, you know, explaining the business impact to them, I think some CEOs will get it and, and they will just say, okay, makes sense. And they, they think long term and they say, let's do it. And, that, and some CEOs are very people oriented also. So they might immediately get it, right? Hmm. Uh, failing this, uh, one other way is to look at maybe examples of some companies who are do, already doing it. And, and what kind of impact you can see. So, so, so you can sort of um, uh, 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 bring out this uh, competitive instinct like, in the business. Say, look, this, uh, uh, this X company was implementing this and you can see, uh, you can see that, look, they're attracting good, good talent. Okay. Like you can go to, go to LinkedIn, for example. Look, uh, they have all these people working in the company now. You know? so, yep. so we, we need to be able to you know, be better, let's say, right? It doesn't have to be another Malaysian company. Yeah. It can be like companies oh. in US and stuff, right. right? So give them examples of how it's worked, right? And, and, then, and then if a, a visionary CEO might be able to see that, say, oh, I'm excited, let's do it. Yeah. So, so this could be the other way to do that. Yeah. Okay. Like, so, so use kind of like traction or like data or like, yeah. like proof that, it, that this concept actually works. Right? Understood, understood. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. So, okay, let's move on to, to Chai Ping now. Chai Ping, this is a question that, the look, there is, uh, I, I know, and you, you read about it, so, right, there's just actually a lot more pressure now on middle-level managers, right, to keep their teams tight, aligned, motivated to perform their best, right? And because now they are now required to look, to look for signs, especially like you said, you're almost all the time working remote. Although now we, you can see from the traffic jam out there, I think most people are actually back to work already, but there's still uh, some who are working you know, remotely. But for, for managers, right, there's pressure on to look out for signs of, of mental stress, which they never had to worry about before, or even emotional burnout, right? So among their teams, and how can they be proactive to support them back to full health? So what in your own company's uh, experience, right, which is easier for you to answer, how are you helping your mid-level managers to cope with these greater expectations on them? by their bosses. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Karamjit. Um, you know, during the pandemic, right, I, I think, you know, we realized that uh, mental health will become, and, and because we adopted a people-first philosophy, right, um, and because of that, we said that at the heart of it, we will ensure that our people will come first, right? And um, revenue, perhaps second, because the pandemic was a crisis, right? So um, we said if, if that, 
if, if we're going to put people first, what does it mean, right? And we realized that um, we really needed to look at well-being. So mental health was part of it. Uh, and, and the full specs of um, well-being was not just mental, was physical. And at, at that time, while, you know, our, our company remained intact, we also had, uh, you know, employees, family members who were either furloughed or made redundant and all that, right? So oh. we also to help them through that social um, uh, well-being as well as uh, financial well-being. So it was the full spectrum of well-being that we looked at. And we actually curated Right uh, at the start of the pandemic, we said that we'll put in programs to educate our people, right, on mental health and then uh, um, physical health, and and definitely uh, um, uh, financial health as well, right. So because we didn't want to look at um, uh, well being in only at the mental. Uh, from the mental uh, front. Okay. So um, up until today, we still have so uh, almost probably on a my bi monthly basis, right? We had a psychologist, a trained psychologist to come in and talk to our people. We started with the wow. people manager. And then also then we, so the education, the advocacy, mm -hmm. you know, continue up until today, right? And um, we over even allowed, right, for people to call direct to the psychologist if they need, right? Oh. So thank you. And the leaders were, were very cooperative. And, and this is the kind of partnership, right, that HR needs to have, right, uh, with the business, right, to make sure that we walk that journey, right, with our leaders. And, and therefore, you know, because when, when we all transitioned to working from home, you know, everything changed, the pandemic yeah. was real, for, death was, you know, confronting us and all that, right? So what do we do? So we supported our people through it. The psychologist was there, but more importantly, our line managers, our people managers and our leaders were equipped, right? And they almost could tell, um, you know, can 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 kind of pick up telltale signs, right? And I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. right? So if a leader or a, a people manager runs a meeting and the video is on all the time or insists on everybody switching on their camera, okay. um, and that happens, right? But for whatever reason, one employee does not turn on the camera. Okay. The manager would pick up and they would talk to my HR business partner. So that partnership is very real, right? The trusted partnership is very real. Mm -hmm. And whole and behold, uh, we had a couple of, you know, um, near scale, right? Kind of um, incidents, right? Mm. And uh, one of the leaders actually called me. I said, now the thing about mental health is this, we are not the experts in mental health. Right. All we can do, we are just first aiders, right? We won't be able, we might be, for example, in a first aid situation, we might be able to do resuscitation, but we can't operate on a patient. So the leader actually called us up and said that. So I said, the next thing is, we have already called the family member, immediate admission into the hospital, right? Wow. So they, they get specialist treatment, right? And um, wow. thankfully, right, I, I think we were able to arrest, you know, um, the situation, address it, and... Uh, the, the 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 two or three cases that we had right uh, the near scare cases yep. were all dealt with you know um seamlessly i would say and at, i think the outcome was 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 great right so therefore i think you know, the role of hr today uh, you know mental health and all that is real and and today you know i, I think uh, we have about um in just in malaysia now we have probably 40 um mental health first aiders right they go through a very rigorous uh, program uh, and they've just completed, as I speak with, they've actually just completed it like in the last couple of weeks. Okay. And um, it's the next step of, you know, our advocacy, our education and awareness, right? So that's real because that really is also not just people first, but that also speaks to our brand as an organization mm. and also ESG, what is our social responsibility. Yep, yep, yep. And also, I think importantly, right, um, our our culture, right? And mm. our, our employee value proposition right so i think and 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 a lot of these i you know sometimes if i look at my attrition rate right at mid so i, I think industry attrition is probably at 20 percent, right if okay. i can just you know uh respectably say that ours is about 14.7 percent mm. you know it's all these you know added together it's all those micro moments right we talk yep. about right yeah that is important right so the role of hr obviously has has transformed mm. and transitioned and and therefore is it just that digital journey that we go through or do we have digital um, experience digital yeah. transformation coupled with strongly right mm. on employee experience and living mm. and breathing our purpose right wow interesting man
Very interesting and, and very challenging. But uh, like it's the new reality and which is why I think when you're talking, it felt like you're also saying uh, probably the Dato Arif is, it's like Dato Arif must be thinking, hey, that's that's what I mean, humanizing HR. So now, and which is nice now, we're moving to uh, Dato Arif. I've got a question for you. Uh, and this may be a, a tough one because I was going to ask you, well, how are you driving your HR 5.0 agenda in the next five years? But in this day and age, when things move so fast, I think five years is unrealistic. Let's talk about how are you driving the HR 5.0 agenda maybe over the next three years, a thousand days, right? Because things can change after that. So, And also, if you're benchmarking against any countries out there. Okay, um, I'll start off with the uh, second question first. So some of the countries that we have done studies on for benchmarking purposes are okay. Singapore, the UK, Australia, and Germany. In fact, we've, we've already visited some of these countries. Uh, hey, you should have done, sorry, that you should have done France or so, because the French work so little, man. Yeah, we could, I'll put that down as uh, the next place that we need to visit. <laughs> okay. So in the, see, in the next five years, uh, meet this uh, widespread need for upskilling, uh, we at HRD Corp feel that the future of the global industry does look bright. You know, a study by Accenture forecasts that AI, artificial intelligence, could double annual global economic growth by 2035, led by a 40% increase in technology-led labor producti productivity and innovation. AI is also expected to create a virtual workforce or intelligent automation, which will be adept at problem solving and self-learning, leading wow. to efficiency and better output. Uh, I have another step. PricewaterhouseCoopers also predicts a 14% jump in global GDP by 2030 by virtue of development and adoption of AI. But wow. this needs to be needs, but this growth needs a future prepared workforce. So this is why at HRD Corp. For the last six months, we've been working very feverishly, going out to wherever this tech, wherever these skilling uh, trainings are available. That's why we, we went to Washington, we went to the UK, uh, we visited Singapore, as I said earlier, SAP, Oracle. Yep. Yeah. In fact, uh, Accenture has a tech caution, uh, which they make it mandatory for all their employees so that all employees are equipped with the necessary uh, tech knowledge to be able to interact not only with, uh, with their peers, but also with their clients, so that they are able to prepare for their, for their, their clients' needs for the future. So we are trying to uh, bring all these programs and make it available. Uh, technology has helped us make these programs available online. True. So you don't need face-to-face -face training anymore. For a lot of these programs, we can bring in a trainer from anywhere in the world, and we can set up, you know, we, we encourage uh, companies to use their levy even to set up their own academies in-house. Oh, wow. Interesting. They can use up to 20% of their levy. Uh, uh, it's called The scheme is called ALAT. Uh, they can purchase uh, conferencing uh, tools, okay. laptops, and build their own academy in-house. And this will allow them then to assess training anywhere in the world. Oh. We have made, you know, this, this uh, the new regime at HRD Corp has been very uh, focused in ensuring that for the levy that these employers pay, for the pool of funds that are available, they must make best use of it. And so for the next five years, we're looking to add on to these training programs and to also ensure that employers, previous to this, we used to have a limit on how much an employer can use from his levy because okay. this was on mass training. They okay. need to cap uh, training fees so that more people get trained. But now we've changed that on its head. We are now, we've, not in, we've, we've removed the ceiling so that the employer, if he needs to send his employee to anywhere in the world, and even, even if it's cost 50,000, 60,000, he can do so. As wow. Justifies the spending, uh, we, don't, we don't cap the limit or the, the, the use okay. zone levy. Right, but I'm telling you, I'm very surprised to hear that, Dr. Arif. I'm sure, you know, you got to go around with, a, you got to walk around with a bodyguard now because all the trainers in the country are not going to be happy. How come you allow people, companies to train online anywhere in the world, man? Come on, man. my Purdue Nasi. So that's a very crazy but but bold decision or so. So what led to that? Huh? I'm, I'm very intrigued. Yeah, I think the last two years because of uh, COVID, I think we've learned that uh, we cannot just rely on face-to-face -face training. Uh, we have to open it up. And a lot of our trainers, you know, I have to be very frank and open here. A lot of our trainers are not yet ready to go online. They don't have enough content. They don't have enough material. 
and neither are they adept at training online. Okay. So, that maybe with this competition from worldwide, our trainers will then pick up the course. Correct. Of course, they're not going to be happy in the beginning, but I think sooner or later they need to be pushed in the direction that the government has said so that we are able to compete, if not globally, at least regionally. Wow, very good, man. Um, I'm I'm very impressed, but it, it's really tough. Okay, cool. So look, now I've got I've got the, I'm going to go quickly back to Derek now, Derek. Right. So there's a question from uh from a uh, Vafa Chow, right, who's a senior manager in the Aerospace and Defense Malaysia Aviation Group. So he's asking, uh, what HR leaders need uh, to to have to be relevant in the future, and I would bet that the future is actually now. So what do HR leaders need to be relevant today? La? Let's say, because the future is now, right? Not, not like one year or two years down the road. A good question, by the way. It is. Um, hmm. I, I think because the, the pace of change in the world is so fast, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and as I said, just now, like competition for talent is crazy. The world is getting yeah, smaller, et cetera. Uh, when, I, when I first started going into recruitment, I remember hearing this term a lot. Oh, you know, HR should start moving from being operational to more strategic. HR yeah. should move from being more operational to more strategic. And this was the, 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 the mantra I heard for the like 10 years. Uh. Hey, but stop I, it. I've been hearing this from 2002 when I used to start, start oh, writing for right? HR. Okay. 2002. <laughs> <laughs> but, but because the world is moving so fast, I actually think there's another phase really. So instead of just being strategic, I actually think HR has to be creative. So that's actually the next phase, like creative in the sense where uh, uh, you have, we have to start being very bold at like testing and trying new ideas. Some of them have never been tested before. Okay. And, yeah. and to have the, this uh, sort of entrepreneurial spirit uh, in some sense, uh, right? To, so in a, because if you want to move fast enough to tackle the new world, uh, if you like, you have to also be prepared to sometimes get things wrong. Yeah, of you course. Know, be and, brave, and, and, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and it is actually part of that creative process, right? So, so from being operational to strategic, I think the next phase actually for each other to be creative, like actually really come up with things that make sense for the company. Yeah. In the and in 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 the context of also the type of talent that they want to hire, mm-hmm. you know, and not just be like um like like uh you know like just like uh, uh one size fits all kind of approach like if you like yeah, yeah. and being very adaptable in that sense so i think hr leaders should be able to graduate to that kind of level okay yeah. nice i like that it, it syncs with what you know hrd uh hrd corp also is doing right uh forcing uh, the bar to be raised man that's incredible very again i can't shake it it's really bold for them to do that because it's going it is hugely unpopular but well done to hrd cop so typing look there there are, there are quite a few questions also right that have come in also but because you mentioned esg uh, typing unless you take something else, there's actually a question from facebook uh, viewer uh, uh, samuel naden right how can hr drive organizations towards sustainability sounds like a very big question but if you can give the quick you know, two minute drill down because we are almost at like form, uh, you know, and the 15 minute mark of our session, I got uh, questions further for you all. So you want to take this or you got something else you want to answer? That's fine. No, uh, I, I could take this. Uh, I'll take a stab at it. And, uh, you know, Dato and Derek, you know, please okay. feel free to chime in or, or Karamjit, please feel free to yeah. chime in. Uh, I'll just, uh, you know, just just look at, you know, the role of HR today, right? Uh, and think about uh, when I said ESG just now, or even if we, you know, put another layer on it, sustainability and all that, right? Um, think about the, the data that we hold today, right? So, you know, as a HR professional, you know, hopefully our insights are all data driven and think about the data that, that we have. Um, uh, all the sensitive data from, you know, your, your license, your, your birth yeah. certs, your number, you know, uh, your date of birth, your medical, perhaps even your medical records, uh, your background checks and, and, and your passport and so on and so forth, right? So that's why I, I thought, you know, uh, in the space of uh, ESG, right, cybersecurity becomes important, right? And um, again, I, I'm not a tech person and I don't pretend that, you know, I, I understand, you know, the tech world very well. But if you think about IoT or even cloud or blockchain, right, can we use technology as an enabler to ensure their cybersecurity, right, to store data? Because then that form part of ESG as well, right? How do we decentralize uh, data storage? How then do we, you know, uh, minimize latency, right? So that we can go to the source faster because now if we think about um, 
you know, cybersecurity, that's one part of it. But the other part yeah. is also, you know, HR is expected, right, to be so data-driven, okay. you know, and draw those insights. But at the same time, there must be speed to action as well, right? How then yeah. do we draw data very, very quickly, right? So that we can form insights to help our business, right? Because we are looking at cost optimization. We are looking at, you know, where is, you know, um, where are, you know, the cost-driven conversations, right? Whether is it to build a new hub or whether is it to, to shift our operations to uh, and for greater efficiency. So I think the whole conversation around uh, sustainability or ESG for that matter, or even digital hate. HR should be around, you know, helping the business. So the the, mm. the the digital piece of it should be, you know, uh, an enabler. Yeah. And I think people start thinking about, you know, I think the earlier conversation around, you know, are we still relevant, you know, and all that. I think the question is, are we going to stay relevant, right? Do we want to stay relevant? I think I, I think it's a point of uh, inflection and a point of self reflection, yeah, right? Okay. We as uh, professionals, obviously, you know, my role today has also, right? Um, no one. Well, I myself never thought that as a HR professional, I can also lead, you know, the entire organization, right? Mm. So, you know, are you willing, right? Again, willing to be bold. I think it was mentioned earlier. Yep. Willing to be bold, try it, you know, test it, learn from it, and then refine it, right? And that's where innovation comes as well, right? Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, we, we just need to, and, and I have a running joke here, right? So I always say we cannot be cut up. You know, uh, and there's a there's a Malay saying to it, there's an English saying to it, and then there's a Mandarin saying to it, right? So there's a wrong word to use now. <laughs> election time when you say kata, people start asking okay, you. No, no political <laughs> questions, please, are uh, from the audience. Okay. Kata di bawah tempurung. That was what I meant. I don't know what you were thinking, Karamjit, but I meant kata di bawah tempurung or okay. frogs under or in Mandarin is uh jing di zi wa, right? So I guess you know, we as HR professionals, right, I think we have to live and breathe this, right, and, and I think, again, it's a point of inflection where we can make a difference, right, are we going to stay relevant, what yeah, are we going to yeah. do to get more capable, I, again, I'm not the most tech person around, you ask sure. any of my colleagues or team, right, do I any, do I understand blockchain, oh, well, okay, I've got some understanding of it, but I have to start understanding it, because mm -hmm. if that is really going to drive ESG, right, and our pledge as an yep. organization, Right, um, because we are into the the business of financial inclusion of and all that, then then I have to understand it. I, I may not have to do the coding and the, yeah, the scripting, yeah, but I have to understand it, right? So we have to stay relevant and not be the kata. My version of yeah, kata yeah. karang. <laughs> okay, fine. Look, okay, thank you, Shabek. I'm gonna go to uh, uh, Dr. Arif now, but also when I come back for the two of you, uh, because you mentioned about wanting to be relevant, stay on top. Actually, a question from an anonymous attendee, which is, what are some of the quick changes that HR can do in the next six to 12 months, right, to be more progressive? Kind of interesting. The two of you think about it and come back with some quick answers, but I got a question for, for Dato now, right, which is, uh, I'm gonna ask you, what are your thoughts, right, uh, on, on the demands of Gen Z workforce? And I know Derek will want to jump in here also, and you can do that, Derek, right? How, uh, Derek, uh, how can employers uh, meet the demands of, of this generation in an effective way? I think uh, employers are already uh, learning that uh, they have to change the way uh, that they, they, they deal with the Gen Zs of the world. Uh, even from the point of hiring, uh, for example, uh, those uh, previously we used to have uh, multiple layer steps of interviews. You have the, you know, the first interview and the second interview and the third interview. Yep. I think employers are beginning to find out that if you have more than one uh, level, uh, the Gen Zs are not going to be interested. If you wow, know, interesting. They can offer on the first interview, uh, you'll find the second time you call him, he's probably already working somewhere else or probably not answering your phone anymore. Wow. Because, uh, these are some examples of, of different ways of dealing with the Gen Z. So you've got to make it as painless as possible. Uh, you've got to make the process of hiring uh, as easy as possible for the Gen Zs. You've also got to understand that they are no longer confined by the bound physical boundaries of where they are. Mm -hmm. They are able to work wherever they are remotely, mm -hmm. as long as you, because they probably have a more, uh, they're probably more skilled in a lot of the tools that are available. Oh to yeah, them. they're digital natives, what? correct. Right. So, um, you, you know, they would not find it uh, too, um, um, I mean, they would not find it too comfortable to be asked to come to the office just to attend a one hour, two hour, yeah. meeting, you know, uh, and then listen to things that, you know, they could have learned on their own, you know, because at the end of the day, for them, uh, uh, speed matters, um, uh, you know, being, being able to function uh, in the way that they have felt that they can 
do it better with the tools that are currently available. So I think employers are, are learning. Uh, and this is also one of the reasons why uh, people don't want to work seven days a week anymore, or even six days a week, or even five days a week. And I think that is why even in the UK, they've had to come up with a four-day work week, because for the Gen Zs, work-life balance is very important. Wow. And it's much time to spend the money they make. So it's not just about making money, but they need to want to spend those money as well. So I think it is for all these reasons that I think employers are starting to, 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 to adapt and adopt uh, practices which, uh, which then can attract talents from the Gen Z. Okay, cool, man. Very interesting. Okay, now I, I've, I've got uh, so many questions are coming in already, but we are almost out of time. But, uh, so I asked you all the question earlier. I tried, uh, Derek, you first. Uh, you want to take that question about, you know, the next six to 12 months, what can HR do to be more progressive? And then, Peng, you answer the same question. Yeah, just, just something very simple you can start doing. So I, I think uh, maybe open up a channel. You just ask your employees what they want. I mean, like, I'm talking about some quick things. that You're not going to implement everything. You know, I'm not asking you to, and, and you should be upfront in telling people like, look, we can't implement every day. But as a starting point, we now we now have this place for you to like maybe anonymously give some feedback, you know, what you think, and maybe like you can tell them like, this will reach the CEO or reach the head of HR, whatever it is, right? Start by doing something like this. And once you gather more feedback and information, you can make those decisions later. Right. And, and again, so I, I think that could be like a, a quick way okay. to kind of change each other. Okay, but later, you say make people, if it's a younger set, that they don't want to wait for decisions to be made later. Do you want to promise that we'll come back within you know, a, a week with a decision? Because when you say later, the Gen Z will probably, ah, yeah, these guys are not serious, not sincere. I don't know. Yeah, I think most of the time it's just about communication. If upfront you can tell them, look, we, we want to elevate ourselves, go to a different level. So we're not sure what's the right direction, let's say. And then but then we would love to hear your voice, yeah. you know, what you think, right? Okay. And and then um as we listen to all these opinions, where we find it, you know, we it's appropriate, it's aligned with the goals of the business, we may implement it or we okay. may not. But as a starting point, here's a channel, right? Understood. Okay. Uh chapping you okay, thanks, Derek. Sorry, uh, chapping you want to take this? Yeah, I, I think uh, a key takeaway for me is I think we as uh, HR professionals, right? I think we, again, I, I'm just going to use uh, my version of Kata. I think we we just need to uh, stay curious, right? And, and stay relevant, you know, and, and make sure, you know, we, we go up the value chain, create the value and go up the value chain, right? And uh, learn to draw uh, conclusions or insights from data, right? Because mm -hmm. that will help the business and work with the business, right? Because I think, I think a lot of HR professionals shun data because, you know, and if you're going to act like a, a backroom operator, you'll always be a backroom operator. Again, this is an inflection point. Are we going to kind of, you know, kind of say, look, you know, we already have a seat at the table. What yep. are we going to do about it? Yeah. Think about it. Understood. Okay, you mentioned key takeaway because, yeah, that's my, my final run of questions for you all because we're out of time. And I just saw the signal, Karam, okay, end the, end the session. Now, otherwise, we'll go on. Right? It's very easy to go on because it's getting excited. Everybody's leaning forward now. But uh, Derek, your, your key takeaway also for this session, then I'll have Dato Arif give his final thoughts on the key takeaway also. Yeah, I think key takeaway, yes, key takeaway is that competition for talent is expected to get tougher and tougher. Oh, it boy. doesn't matter whether you're hiring for tech or you're hiring for a retailer, you know, or hiring for manufacturing, you know, it is getting tougher, right? As businesses try to compete for talent, the world's getting smaller, talent is more mobile. So if you're in HR, it's, it's really time to start making the decisions today, right? You make the decision today and then the impact will happen tomorrow. But you really have to start moving now already. And, and, the, and, the, and the companies or the CEOs that can align with this HR very closely on this vision, I actually believe they win the talent war. And if you win the talent war, you win the business war, like, if you like, right? Well, so, right. Uh, yep. yeah. So actually, to start thinking today. Okay. Cool, cool. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's all your final, uh, uh, your key takeaway from today's discussion. Um, I feel that today, while we've talked a lot about tech, yep. for HR, they have to pay the balance between the new and the old because you still have the Gen X, you still have boomers working uh, you know, within the same... Hey, age. that's me, man, boomers. <laughs> yeah. So I think HR, they have to have uh, some, uh, the, some key skills that they need to have is the, the skill to be persuasive, the key to be able to influence not only their peers, uh, other workers, but they also need to be able to influence their CEO, their CEO and other C-levels 
because they are the they they need to play the role of being inclusive. They need to bring in people from the center, from the sphere, from the peripherals, uh, and they need to bring in a lot of talent from outside. Uh, the one thing that we didn't talk about today is people with different abilities. Uh, you know, senior citizens, because we are moving towards a aging society, we need to be able to uh, you know ensure that they have a role to play uh, moving forward. Uh, we've got a labor shortage, but yeah. at the same time, we have a large pool of uh, prisoners with uh, you know minor offenses uh, not being able to contribute because of the stigma. So there's so many people and talent out there that we've not yet brought into the conversation. I, I think we need to bring this into the conversation. I, I, I just want to uh, end today by, by inviting people to join us for our Human Capital Conference and Exhibition. Ah, yes taking place on the 29th and 30th of November because these conversations are going to be taking center stage. And, and uh, the more people start talking about this, more pe people getting involved in these conversations is going to help this country move forward. Thank Absolutely. You. And that's what it's all about, right? moving the country forward, right? And, and raise the raise the water levels, right? So that all boats are rise with the tide. Okay, great. Uh, uh, but, and since you mentioned your conference, look, uh, I just want to alert everyone that we check on our Facebook uh, comments and even here, right? Uh, there is also for, for DNA, uh, together in Malaysia Kini, we have launched the uh, Top in Tech Innovation Award. And uh, this is uh, year two of the award. So please go and check out whether you're going uh, to uh, nominate your company or your CEO, right? For one of the many categories. So it's very interesting. It's all around innovation, how you're using technology, right? To improve your competitiveness. So it's a very interesting award. We've done it before last year. A lot of amazing judges there, also lead judges. So we're excited about this. Please participate and make and raise the level for the judges. Make it hard for them, for us to pick a winner. And with that, thank you, the three panelists. There are some questions that are still coming in, but so for all those who are listening, during the closing uh, uh, video, the, the, the panelists will try to answer some of your questions also. Yeah? So stay on. Uh, but let's bring on Zelia now for her closing remarks. Uh, uh, also key takeaway for this session. Wow, that was a really great one hour. Very, very engaging. I think I walked away not with nuggets of wisdom. I think I have like spoonfuls and bowfuls. I've taken down a lot of uh, notes. And I think one of the things is like, you know, it, it makes me like, can I work for you, uh, Chai Ping? <laughs> <laughs> so so, so the, the, the takeaway I got from here is if I can sort of use just a, a summary phrase, right? I feel that to answer some of the question that's in the chat, what do we mean by HR 5.0? At least personally, after hearing from the three panelists, is that I think HR 5.0 defines humanizing human resource. Mm. It is like we talk about digital, um, we talk about people and all, right? And we hear Chai Ping mentioning about employee experience. Uh, we hear about how businesses, you, you struggle between a people-first philosophy versus a bottom-line impact, uh, 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 sort of like, you know, a needs to meet, right? And I think a HR professional today, um, it is really a very exciting ex and also a very yeah. challenging position for you yep. to be in. There are so much that you need to know and maybe the mental health support uh, should be prioritized to you because you will have to sort of like, you know, lead the company to embrace all the changes to remain relevant because the people are the biggest assets of any businesses at all today. And, uh, me working with uh, entrepreneurs, yep. uh, I like what Derek mentioned, from being just uh, operational, you need to start thinking strategic. And moving forward, you really need to be creative. Don't be afraid to try. Because if you don't try, then you will never be able to yeah. progress and move uh, forward, right? right? So to me, in short, I feel really, HR 5.0, it is humanizing the human resource, the entire value chain of human resource itself. And I wish by the time my daughter, who's a Gen Z, comes into the workforce, um, she gets good bosses, get to work in a great company and to actually be able to contribute. For sure, for sure. She'll, be, she'll get a great boss or she'll be that great boss herself. There you go. Uh, with your influence. Yeah, I hope so and I pray so. Very good. Okay, with that, folks, we've come to the end of another Top in Tech episode. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time, all of you, and the questions that have come in. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And this video conversation can be caught, you know, on, on DNA and, and, and even I think HRD, uh, HRD uh, 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 Corp and also DNA, you know, Facebook, you can catch it all again. Uh, thank you all for your time and we'll see you again for the next one, which is coming up next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.